Right, thank you very much. Uh, I will try to be brief. I'm Neil Jackson from DFID. Um, I'd like to explore the thesis being advocated in the book uh, that there's a win-win for statistics by, by looking at a few of the case studies. But first, I'd like to just sort of say a few more general remarks in terms of where I'm coming from, from probably more sort of traditional school of how statistics are, are generated. Um, I suppose the first thing says, you know, I am a you know, strong believer in the great sort of empowering capacity of statistics. So that's why, as a profession, statistics uh, appeals to me. Um, but I should say I'm probably sort of less attached to whether the statistics themselves need to be generated through participatory processes or not. Um, and in terms of the way the win-wins characterize, I'm a little uneasy about the sort of characterization of participatory statistics being good while extractive, externally controlled statistics are bad. I think that's, to some extent, a false dichotomy. Um, I see it very much as sort of horses for courses. And there's something in uh, Carlos's paper that I, I thought was sort of hit, hit the, the nail here, where he sort of says that different types of data fulfilling different objectives mm. require different approaches to information collection. So it, means it seems to me that that's, that's exactly right. In terms of uh, data that's produced by some of the more traditional means, uh, such as sample surveys, but I think these can still be of immense value. Uh, and that depends on whether producers follow some of the sort of fairly well-established principles for how the statistics are produced. So first of all, producers should seek participation in statistical surveys through informed consent. The producers should understand who are the users of their statistics, and they should engage effectively with users to understand their needs, and should disseminate the statistics in ways that are accessible so people can use them. Uh, they should also provide information about the strengths and weaknesses of the statistics in relation to their uses, so people aren't misled by what they've got. So it seems to me if you use these general principles for producing statistics, then that is an, imp uh, an amazingly em empowering thing in itself. And you know, you're unlocking the value of the statistics. In terms of the statistics that government wants, often those are generated through household surveys. And they're there you know, designed to meet the needs of government. But that gives information for the whole country. A lot of the sort of discussion today is about local statistics. And by its nature, uh, household surveys can't tell you much about what's happening at the local level. You know, that's a problem as much in the UK as it is in, in developing countries. I would say, though, that uh, insofar as a lot of evaluations are carried out in you know, to, to, to assess the impact of interventions, if that generates a lot of statistics, it is very important that that information itself is disseminated in an open and accessible way. If we go to a great expense of collecting the data, we're really selling ourselves short if we don't make that available for, for, for wider uses, uh, particularly for people, you know, local people in the community who might find, find uses for those statistics. So that's by, by way of background. Um, turning to the win-win uh, thesis, um, I'd like to just say a little bit about the case study uh, on in the Philippines on the implementation of decentralized health sector policy in the Philippines. Um, this was an intervention that's really explicitly aimed at promoting citizen participation. So the idea of this was a sort of empowering type of intervention. Uh, health budgets were devolved to local level, and the challenge was how do you use that money to, to best effect in the area? And what happened through a process of reviews and involving stakeholders, including health workers, they, they found that the data that came from the Department of Health wasn't particularly good. But they did have access to data from the health workers themselves in terms of their, their own notes and households, uh, household records. And that was an amazingly powerful source of information. So with that, they found things that nobody knew. They, they didn't realize how many accidents are caused through roads. And that led to the decision to sort of reduce speed limits, that, you know, according to the study. It's a very simple way that's cheap that has an immediate effect in terms of using the data. There's other examples of how the ambulance services were used more effectively. So for me, that's you know, a pretty inspirational story. In terms of whether it's participating statistics or not, I mean, it seems to me that the data itself came from, from the records of the health workers. It was a participative process that maybe made use of that analysis you know, and analyzed them to good effect. But it, you know, th there's nothing inherently about the participatory nature of the, the data itself. Uh, you know, so the data itself was powerful, irrespective of where it had come from. And in terms of the question of the win-win, clearly this was an empowering exercise, no doubt about it. Um, but I'm not sure how generalizable the results were. It seems to me that 
this was very good analysis of data for that local area, and that was used to good effect in the area. So the other thing I would sort of say is in terms of the health department's own statistics, it seems to me that there are interesting questions. What was wrong with that data? Could that data not have been used to complement the household records in the sense that part of the analysis is only as good as those household records were. I mean, so I'm not sure how complete those were. They, they seem to be pretty good in terms of how they were used, but what I'm, my point is the whole accuracy and robustness of the analysis dependent on that data. If there are other sources, if they're no good, the question is why not? And in a sense, very much take the point of Robert about the power of triangulation. If you sort of merge these data sources, then the data can be all the stronger. The second example I was wanting to briefly discuss was Carlos's paper, uh, which again, I sort of saw that as a sort of very well designed uh, evaluation. And it did generate persuasive evidence in terms of how a particular program of starter packs had been targeted. The idea of the program was meant to be targeted on the PER. And by designing the survey in a particular way, I think the evidence was quite clear showing you know, it wasn't particularly well targeted. Now, what I would sort of say about that is, in a sense, that the strength of the analysis depended on the categories that were used. I mean, I think there's three categories. There's food secure, food insecure, and extremely insecure. And in a sense, you know, you can discuss different people what your categories are, but once you settle in those categories, it's very important that you impose that discipline and use that across the piece. So in a sense, it's a mixture of imposing that sort of external discipline of, ca of classification and then combining that with uh, um, you know, the participative process of getting people to sort of classify themselves is where the power lies. So again, I would sort of say that this was an evaluation. The objective of this was really, as far as I could see, was to find out you know, how well targeted was the program. There was an exercise where people were involved in terms of generating the statistics that helped to answer that target, uh, you know, you know, th about targeting. But I'm not sure whether the process itself was sort of uh, particularly sort of empowering to the individuals. It seemed to me more this is a good, well-designed evaluation that used participatory techniques to generate statistics. Finally, if I can, <laughs> uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the other example, which I thought was very interesting, the Ubu Dehi, probably haven't pronounced that right, in Rwanda, where I think the claim is that through generating data in villages, you could provide a sort of a real-time rural census, which is quite ambitious. I better not sort of say too much, because we want to lay time for discussion. I, I suppose, I mean, again, this is an example of real empowerment, and again, that was the objective of you know, th the process that lay behind it, and therefore, you know, it seemed to me it's successful that way. In terms <coughs> of the statistics, clearly this was generating a lot of information on villages, but I think, again, coming back to one of my principles, it's very important if you're using data to understand the strengths and limitations. Now, compared with the standard census, this process was almost certainly generating data much more cheaply, <coughs> and was also generating data much more regularly than full census. But, you know, we do still need to recognize some of the limitations of that, Again, in terms of the categories, it seemed th the way the paper described it, these were generated through discussion with communities. And I don't know to what extent those categories were imposed <coughs> then across the piece. But unless you're imposing the same categories across everybody, you're not really going to be comparing like with like. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you're looking at measures of poverty, there is a sort of tendency to sort of benchmark yourself against people you know. So if you have a particularly rich village, will they all sort of classify themselves as rich or will they sort of apply the categories objectively. So I, I just mentioned that as a risk. The other risk is in terms of the way this information was used was to allocate resources. I take the point about the way you generate these statistics is checks and balances through people checking their other work. Nevertheless, if this data is being used in that way, it does raise a perception of to what extent are these numbers being generated to make a case. And certainly in terms of a real census, you know, the census is in developing countries are, can be highly contested. And in terms of the trustworthiness, trustworthiness of the statistics, and it's incumbent upon the National Statistics <coughs> Institute mm -hmm. to show how transparently the data are, are, are produced. And obviously there are weaknesses in the data that are generated through this participative process. It would still be a mistake to ignore that useful, very rich source of information. And again, I would come back to the point, if I'm not sure in terms of all these case studies do give you a sort of win-win, it seems to me there are different aspects of the win-win that each illustrate. But it does seem to me that there is a win-win to be had in terms of the triangulation approach in terms of marrying up 
uh, statistics from some of the more traditional sources that are generated for particular purposes and making better use of the statistics that are generated by other means to have a, a richer source for better statistics all around. So, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, on the live streamed event now, um, we've, we've got about 10 minutes to go. You're welcome to stay to continue the discussion after the live streaming goes down. But at this point, I'd like to just ask, ask um, the audience for any comments. Uh, you can also ask questions or even provide answers to Robert's challenges. But let's try to keep the contributions brief at this point, so about a minute each, if you can. Who wants to come in first? Yeah. 